It's almost one year to the day since the start of the 2022 Qatar World Cup. In the build up to the tournament, we saw a lot of scepticism over whether Qatar could hold such a major tournament. There were fears regarding pretty much every facet of hosting, from the weather, to the quality of the football, to the potential for civil unrest. Stories in the papers were persistently running about Qatar's lack of readiness from the fan zones to the accommodation to the stadiums. Yet once the tournament had begun, we didn't really hear much about these previously held concerns. So it got me wondering, what is the legacy of the Qatar World Cup? Were the concerns highlighted pre-tournament ever valid? Were Qatar good hosts to the many visitors to the country from the players to the staff, journalists and the fans? What has been the lasting impact of the 2022 World Cup? And finally, will the tournament be seen as successful in years to come? Ladies and gentlemen, we're digging back through the archives once again to explore the legacy of the Qatar World Cup. So firstly, let's take a look at the concerns that were regularly spouted by the British media. I don't know so much about other countries' media, but I know it's certainly persistent here in the UK. The first example of this is in regards to accommodation. The nation had 12 years to get its affairs in order, ready to host over a million people flocking to its nation. Yet in this article from The Independent just before the tournament started, it details how the accommodation was lacklustre and equated it to Fire Festival, the infamous event that saw influence sleep in rough due to poor planning. Additionally, certain fan villages were stated as resembling building sites. Lastly, the stadiums were less scrutinised going into the World Cup. It's clear these were prioritised by the nation and six of them had been tested in the 2021 Arab Cup. However, it would be remiss not to talk about the deaths involved with building these stadiums. Hassan al Fwadi said the figure was between 400 to 500 deaths in an interview with Piers Morgan. However, The Guardian reported it to be around 6,500. As DW Fact Check states though, it's impossible to ascertain a concrete number given unreliable data provided by Qatari authorities. Firstly, let's tackle the issue of accommodation and fan zones and work out what was the reality. Was it a building site with discarded bricks everywhere or was it a Middle Eastern paradise? The answer lies somewhere in the middle. It was certainly touch and go in places in order to get the work done in time. And some of the temporary accommodation used was a little basic, albeit that was by design. In fact, the infamous shipping container hotels have gone on their own journey since Argentina lifted the trophy. The reality of the pods, which were equipped with Wi-Fi and air conditioning, well, they were not bad, but not great either. However, remarkably, the once laughed at containers have now been repurposed into temporary accommodation for victims of the Turkey-Syria earthquake earlier in 2023. A good cause and certainly a PR win for FIFA and Qatar, but it does set the mind racing as to whether these pods could have been used for the migrants who now find themselves living in multiple occupancy residencies. It's a conundrum for sure. As for the hotels, well, the vast majority are still standing tall amidst the background of evanescent World Cup memories in Doha. Eye-wateringly expensive from the outset, many of the rooms dropped in price from around $1,000 to less than $300 by the time the tournament started. The hotels are certainly quieter now the tourism has died off, but with reports linking Qatar to the 2036 Olympics, they may be needed once again. In regards to fan zones, Qatar wanted buzz and vibrancy and colour. And in the end, they got it, but not without a few hiccups along the way. At the beginning of the tournament, it's clear there were some causes for concern. Overcrowding and supporters being turned away made headlines at the start of the tournament as Qatar's fears seemed to be coming true with 1.2 million fans descending on Doha. This was likely exacerbated by the alcohol ban within stadiums that it said store fan zones get really busy. Yet as the tournament went on, this seemed to become less and less of a problem. As initial World Cup fever waned into the norm, so did the mad rush to fan zones. And that coupled with renewed Qatari security competence saw far less overcrowding and crucially for supporters, far less Sorry mate, you can't come in. In fact, as the group stage ended, Qatar was actually making more of a conceited effort to get fans to come to Qatar just to be a part of the fan zones. They launched a new Haya card, a more fun sounding visa that allowed ticketless fans to come and be part of the party atmosphere. The fan zones buzz that Qatar desperately longed for 
had been realised. After overcoming initial obstacles and security getting better as the tournament went on, the fan zones were immensely popular with spectators from all over the world. The stadiums in Qatar were architectural marvels, uniquely designed, but they were never meant to last long. Pre-tournament, it was divulged that the stadia must reflect its history and culture, and for the designs to meet the following terms of reference. Legacy, comfort, accessibility, and sustainability. The stadiums would be equipped with advanced cool-in technologies to reduce the temperatures within. And lastly, FIFA stated there would be zero waste. Many of the stadiums were able to be disassembled and donated to nations with less developed sports infrastructure. But how successful were they in their pleas? Beginning with design, I think it has to be labelled a resounding success. They absolutely reflected the culture of Qatar through all eight stadiums. Whether they were to your taste or not, they were certainly distinctive, bold and immediately recognisable. And in terms of accessibility in the stadiums, this was undeniably the best World Cup ever. With the stadiums built from the ground up for the tournament, it allowed Qatar to ensure they were properly wheelchair accessible while providing sensory rooms at every stadium. And the legacy of accessibility going forward will be that Qatar 2022 is the benchmark to future World Cups. FIFA also assured fans that this World Cup would be extremely comfortable despite the extreme temperatures often seen in Qatar and largely this was done by their cooling systems. Though this was a solution to a problem that could only really be found by having a World Cup in the Middle East and it certainly didn't send the best message in regards to sustainability. Even with the most efficient system this would still use up a lot of energy which in Qatar is mostly come from fossil fuels. This doesn't even account for the emissions in terms of building the stadiums which also would have been sky high. In a World Cup that FIFA said would be carbon neutral, the efforts on sustainability seemed a bit lacking from the host and the footballing body. Lastly and most imperative on a video about the legacy of Qatar, what has happened to the stadiums since? Were the stadiums donated to nations with less developed sports infrastructure? Or if not, have they been put to good use in Qatar instead? Or are they just rotting away in Doha waiting to see the light of day again? The first stadium to look at is the infamous Stadium 974, named after the amount of shipping containers it's made from. It's so well known due to its ability to be disassembled and reassembled elsewhere, yet as of right now, the ground is still largely intact in Doha. There were rumours of it being part of the Uruguay 2030 World Cup bid, which now is partly true, may be the case. The rest of the stadiums though have found a new purpose, and that is being used to host the AFC Asian Cup 2023, which is actually taking place in January of 2024. Turns out having infrastructure already in situ is quite handy when hosting a major tournament in future. After then, it's less clear what's going to be happening with the stadiums. The Ahmad Bin Ali and Al Janoub stadiums are set to supposedly reducing capacity by half with 40,000 seats donated to sub-Saharan African nations to improve their infrastructure. Education City Stadium will remain part of Qatar's education hub, providing world-class facilities for the city's students. Lucille Stadium is likely to be redesigned into a hotel and shopping mall, and finally Al Bayt Stadium is likely to become, in part, a sports medicine hospital. At this juncture, it's difficult to ascertain whether FIFA's claim of zero waste will come to pass or not. We will find that out after the Asian Cup at the start of 2024. However, I do feel a lot of this will also depend on Qatar's hope to host the 2036 Olympic Games. Next, it's worth exploring Qatar's performance as hosts. How friendly were they to the millions flocking to their nation? FIFA president Gianni Infantino lauded Qatar's unique, cohesive power to bring different nationalities and cultures together in the name of soccer. Ahead of the tournament, critics questioned Qatar's human rights record, their treatment of same-sex relationships, and their treatment of migrant workers, and rightly so. Yet again though, once the football kicked off, these questions were largely pushed to the side. Certainly Qatar tried to paint a narrative of how safe this World Cup was, how friendly it was, how accessible it was, and so on and so forth. 
And I'm sure that in the vast majority of cases, the overwhelming majority of fans came away from the tournament being very satisfied with how they were treated and happy with the atmosphere they partaked in. Yet the narratives around the treatment of migrant workers and people from the LGBT community are certainly still valid. It thus created a very inorganic experience in that, yes, Qatar were very friendly hosts, but in terms of their development as a nation, they still have a lot of growing to do to be fully accepted by the international community. I think the narratives around the 2022 World Cup would have been far different had the football on show been terrible. Instead that the World Cup that the West never wanted ended up being the World Cup that the West never wanted to end. The tournament ended with an average of 2.7 goals per match, the highest we've seen in 28 years. Additionally, this tournament was only 28 days long, which saw matches come flying at you constantly. Maybe it was because the tournament took place in winter with players at their physical peaks that saw the competition be so entertaining. Truthfully, it was the most undeniable aspect that the Qatar World Cup was one of, if not the most entertaining World Cup of all time. And the drama was another level. Germany and Belgium going out in the group stages, Morocco's unbelievable run to the semi-finals, Saudi Arabia defeating Argentina in the opening match, and the high drama was no better epitomised than the final itself. France versus Argentina, two heavyweights duelling it out for the crown. Messi versus Mbappe. A barnstormer was played out that saw a brace for the former and a hat-trick for the latter in a 3-3 draw. Argentina prevailed on penalties, Messi completed football and the shots of him lifting the trophy were spread far and wide. I'll leave it here in terms of talking about the football as I'm sure to want to cover it in another video on another day, but it will certainly live long in the memory of everyone who watched. Look into the future, it seems that Qatar and the Middle East as a whole is not done yet in regards to sports. The announcement that the 2034 World Cup is heading to Saudi Arabia came to the surprise of very few, with no other country even willing to rival a bid against them. Qatar itself is back in hosting duties very soon with the arrival of the 2023 Asian Cup. And where is the Asian Cup heading in 2027? Saudi Arabia, of course. The Middle East is a sporting hotbed of entertainment these days from boxing to Formula One. If it garners eyes and attention, they will be there. In 2027, Qatar will also hold the Basketball World Cup and in 2030, they'll be hosting the Asian Games. Which leads into Qatar's greatest hope for the future, the 2036 Summer Olympics. The reception so far though has been lukewarm at best. It wouldn't actually be Qatar's first foray into trying to host the Olympics with their 2016 and 2020 bids not even being shortlisted. However, having now hosted the World Cup, they can point to that in regards to critics saying they don't have the infrastructure to withstand such a major event. Despite this though, they may still need to join their bid alongside Saudi Arabia in order to prove they have the infrastructure to withstand 10,000 plus athletes. However, a further obstacle is likely to be their treatment of certain groups. The Olympics has far more LGBTQ plus athletes than football and thus reservations are likely to be far greater and boycotts could be expected. Alas, a lot will be determined in regards to Qatar's journey as a nation in the meantime. So with the dust settled, what is the legacy of the Qatar World Cup? Well, on a footballing front, it's one of joyous memories, goals galore, twists at every turn. Off the pitch though, it's far more conflicted. The welcome was certainly forthcoming and friendly, even if it did feel slightly disingenuous. The fan zones and accommodation weren't always perfect, but certainly improved as the tournament went on. The stadiums were architectural marvels, ingeniously designed with comfort and accessibility at the heart of each and every one. In truth, there was a lot to enjoy in regards to this World Cup, even if you were a detractor, but this World Cup will also be remembered for dubious reasons too. The corruption that was so entrenched in this World Cup from the outset was never too far away from people's minds. The treatment of migrant workers remains disputed, but one death is still too many. And also Qatari views on same-sex relationships, for example, will always remain contentious. Some will have problems with their treatment of human rights, while others will argue it's just racism towards the Arab world. If you were deeply distrusting of Qatar before the World Cup, you were unlikely to have your view changed once it started. However, the idea of playing the biggest football tournament in the world, in the desert, in higher heats, in a country with no footballing background seemed ridiculous. Yet, it happened. It was inorganic, it was an oddity. 
but still it happens and to greater success than most would have anticipated. Let me know what you thought of the Qatar World Cup down in the comments. And for now, thank you for watching.